Hi, welcome to the C3 Masterclass with Pastor Phil Pringle. My name is Wayne Simpson and this is my wife Mary. We're the pastors in C3 Church Hong Kong. You're going to love this Masterclass by Pastor Phil. It will both inspire and motivate you. And if you want more information about C3 Church, check out our website c3church.hk. Our service is in English but we do provide both Mandarin and Cantonese simultaneous translation. Enjoy the program and God bless. Everybody, welcome back. What a privilege it is to be sharing the mighty Word of God with you. And I know that this will be life transforming for all of you as you get into the Word and you actually embrace it, digest it into your soul. You're going to find it completely radically transform your world. So we have, we have started to speak about what we have. We've covered who we are in Christ and now we're talking about what we have in Christ. This is New Testament living, New Covenant theology. And throughout the New Testament, again and again, Paul says we have this in Christ. We can do this through Christ. We have this by Christ. And so Jesus is firmly planted at the center. And that's what needs to be emphasized, that the church is meant to be all about Christ. It's an interesting thing that if you ask, what, what does Mercedes Benz stand for? People say cars. Uh, if, if you said, what does Nike stand for? You'd probably say shoes, you know, sports shoes. Or uh, Generally, most companies have one standout feature that, that they're known for. What's Coca-Cola known for? Well, everybody knows the drink. And, but when we say, what's the church all about? People might come up with a hundred different ideas of social action, good works, and various things. The church is meant to be about Jesus Christ. That's... Our, our core value, everything comes out of the fountainhead of Christ. Him we preach, Paul said. And uh, that's got to be the center of our preaching. And he said, him we preach, warning and teaching every man that we might present every person complete in Christ. And so he is saying we preach Christ so that people might be finding what they are in Christ. And in that state, they are complete in Christ. Now, Quite honestly, I don't think that any one of us are going to be perfected or complete before we even die and go to heaven. So that completion in Christ is not something that we, we are waiting for it to be realized so that uh, we can say, oh, as the apostle might, we're hoping that the apostle would say, now they're complete in Christ, we can present them. We are presenting people complete because they are fully living their lives in Christ. And that is what Paul is wanting to achieve with his preaching, his teaching, his warning, his ad admonitions. And so that's where we are talking in this series about being who we are in Christ and what we have in Christ. The first, uh, what we have, we looked at was authority, which is all about how we have dominion in this life through being in Christ. He has given us authority. We're not subject to circumstances. That's subject to us. We are not overruled by life and all of its circumstances and evil spirits and whatever, but we overrule them. We are in control. We are in rulership position. The second uh, part of this that I wanted to cover was the promises. We have been given promises from God. He has given us certain undertakings. He has promised certain things in the Bible. And they've been given to us. One Peter, 2 Peter 1.3 says, His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who has called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Beautiful passage, magnificent. But he is saying his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, to life and godliness. So whatever we need in this life, his divine power has given us all of that. That's one of the promises. And to being a godly person, 
to a life of godliness, which is being godlikeness through the knowledge of him is called by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. They're exceedingly great because they exceed any problem we've got. The promises of God are bigger than anything that you and I are facing today. His promise to be with us, to deliver us, to get us through a thing. All of these have been given to us. Not at just specific moments in our life. They've been already given to us. They're part of the covenant. The promises are there. He will provide for us. He will never abandon us. He's going to be with us through everything. All of these promises of God are yes and amen in Him, in Christ. That's, that's the point. I've heard people say all the promises of God are yes and amen. Well, actually, they're not. They're yes and amen in Him, in Jesus Christ. So when you're in Christ, all the promises of God are activated. You trigger that effect because in Christ, in, your, in the suit, in the iron man, in the being in Christ means that the promises are attracted. They come as part of the package of centralizing Jesus in our life and us in Him. So uh, they're exceedingly great and precious. The reason they're precious is because sometimes they're the only thing in the entire world that are going to actually get you through your challenge, through your difficulty. The promise of God is going to activate a reality in your circumstances that brings a breakthrough, that brings a release, a solution, an overcoming of some kind that actually is a result of a precious promise from God. And through these, we become partakers of the divine nature. That's astonishing. I mean... uh, It's one thing to have things come into our lives, circumstances, but to actually have, if you like, pieces of God, uh, of His nature, become part of what we are, so that by these we are partakers of the divine nature. We we start to become more patient, long-suffering, and uh, sacrificial, loving, kind. All the nature of God starts to become who we are through these promises of God. How do we activate the promises? We speak them. If you're feeling like you're not very patient, start to declare, I'm patient with the patience of Christ in me. If you're an angry person all the time, start to say, I'm peaceful. I can cope with life. If you're depressed, say, I'm joyful. And you might say, well, I can't say that. I'm depressed. Speak the truth and you'll find your emotions start to catch up with what that truth is rather than staying in your current situation. That's what faith is. It overcomes the deal that's in your real natural world with a higher reality. The law of the spirit of life takes you to another dimension which, which rules over that natural dimension that we're living in. So these promises of God, we can rely on them. You know why? Because God, there's some things that God cannot do and one of them is He cannot lie. He cannot lie. So what he has said is going to come to pass. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, uh, the writer of the book of Hebrews, he, he says by, by two immutable things, number one, that God cannot lie, and by the fact that he swore by himself, God took an oath by himself. He wanted to, to encourage us with such absolute certainty that what he has said he would fulfill Number one, he assured us his nature makes it impossible for God to tell an untruth. What he says can be completely relied upon because he cannot lie. Secondly, that he has sworn by his own name that he, since there is no higher, men generally swear by a higher power, there is no higher than God. So he swore by himself, I will make this come to pass. The astonishing thing is God has assured us of his promises and his word coming to pass. I think sometimes believers have trouble believing the Word of God because their own Word isn't believable. And we should be uh, committed to keeping our Word and to not committing ourselves to things that we cannot fulfill, not making promises that we can't, can't keep. But when we actually do make a promise, we should keep it. And not because we've signed legal contracts, but because we said it. Our Word must have veracity, must have trust, trustability, trustworthiness. And so like when we have that faith in our own commitments, it helps us 
believe that God's word is going to also come to pass in our lives. Number three, the principles of God. Okay, we've been given principles that are activated in Christ. And these principles, some of them apply to everybody on earth, such as sowing a seed in the ground. doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, whether you're religious or non-religious, whether you're old or young, rich or poor, when the rain comes and that seed is in the ground, it'll grow up. That's a principle of the seed that applies to everybody on planet earth. But there are principles that apply to us because we're in Christ and to that, to that situation alone. Uh, we, are, we are told all through the, the scripture that, um, that all, these, all these principles will require faith. Faith is the currency of heaven. Uh, when I go to another country, if I'm in Hong Kong and I pull out Australian dollars, they won't work there. Uh, if I go to Europe and, and, and pull out some, uh, some, some uh, money from Indonesia, it's not going to work there. I need the euro in, in Europe. I need, I need Chinese money in, in Hong Kong. If I, go to, if, if I go to heaven and try to use my currency, my works, or I've done this, Lord, and I'm good, and I've been in church for a long time, and I've done that, none of that will work. The currency that activates the principles of God is faith. And faith itself is that principle, that key principle that triggers everything that God wants to do in our lives. And all the way through the New Testament, when Jesus is talking to uh, people who are wanting healing, he says, according to your faith, be it unto you. And what they believed was going to come to pass because that connected them to the power of God. It's so important to live in faith. And faith isn't just about believing, it's about being confident, about being positive, about being bold. And when we move into those areas of having great courage and boldness and confidence and positive thinking, that is the world of God. That's faith in God is light. In Him is no darkness at all. Not even the shadow of turning, the Bible says. So it's not like God lives in doubt and depression and discouragement. He doesn't live there. He lives in the world of light bringing warm, encouraging, life-giving light, just like the sunshine. That is the, the, the principles of God are activated, if you like, in that environment and appropriated. So understand that these principles are very clear all the way through the Scripture. And, and these are laws of the Spirit. So the law of the Spirit is, is the power to take us above the law of sin and death. And that's one of the most powerful principles that we can have. Uh, Romans 8 verse 1, uh, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And then it says the law of the spirit of life has set us free from the law of sin and death. Now the law of gravity in the earth, the principle of gravity is a very real principle. But there's another law called the law of aerodynamics, that if you shape a wing like this and put some jet propulsion in there, it'll actually lift up above the law of gravity. So one law overcomes another law. So there's the law of sin and death. And if you've got sin in your life, then death follows. But once you've received Christ, sin is extinguished. It isn't extinguished by our good works. It isn't extinguished because we decided we're going to get rid of sin. It is extinguished because of the blood of Christ. We've got to lean on that reality. Then it says the law of the spirit of life. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, that elevates us and causes us like that aerodynamics law to rise above the downward pull of sin and death. As you live in the Spirit, live with worship in your heart, singing and worshiping, being filled with the Holy Spirit, Paul says. And as you speak in that heavenly language that God gifts to you, it gives you access right into the supernatural arena where you can live empowered by a power from heaven itself and find yourself living above those conditions that earth wants to drag you down into. All right, number three, what do we have? We have, I'm uh, sorry, number four, what do we have? We have the wisdom of God. This is astonishing. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 1.13, it says, 1.30, you are in Christ Jesus 
who became for us wisdom from God. And in 1 Corinthians 2.16, we have the mind of Christ. Huh, it's, it's incredible. You know, I've um, looked through a lot of commentaries on, on this passage, 1 Corinthians 2.16, because when I read that, I found that astonishing. I'd never even thought that that was a reality. We have the mind of Christ. I'm going like, that's, how could that ever be? I mean, the things he knows, the things he understands, his insight, his wisdom, his, his knowledge. I mean, we have that mind. My mind certainly doesn't feel like that mind, the mind of Christ. And so I looked through the commentaries on it, studied it, and hardly any commentaries actually really fully agree with it. And, and so that, that was kind of troubling. But then I thought, well, who am I going to believe the plain sense of the Word of God, which is what we all should do. Just believe the plain sense of the Word of God. We don't need to try and twist it into our unbelief or our version of what we want it to say. Uh, it, 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 and so there were one or two, though, that said, uh, one of them, I think it was Jameson, Fawcett and Brown said, strange as it may seem, we actually have the mind of Christ. So... And it, strange as it may seem, we actually do have the mind of Christ. And here's the thing that it's another one of those areas where are we going to walk by the side of our eyes, by what we can detect as being our reality or by what the truth of the Bible is saying? We are a new species of being, a new creation. Old is past, new has come. We have the mind of Christ. When we believe that, we're going to have wisdom for every situation we find ourselves in where we don't know what to do. And so often when we're wondering where, where we should go, what we should do, we can say we have the mind of Christ and we will understand. We will get insight into those things. And, you know, even on a very small scale, like when it, I, I've read that people spend nine minutes a day average finding things that they've lost, like car keys, um, wallets, things around the house that have been misplaced. Nine minutes a day. You add that up over a lifetime. That's a lot. But how often do we actually ask the Lord and say, Lord, where is that? We think that it's too small. We think that it's too little. But when we actually just look away to God and look to Him for that wisdom in our mind to be manifested, you'd be surprised how many times even something as small as lost car keys, you'll know stuff. You'll know things. And you'll know what to do. You'll know what to say. You'll know who to phone. You'll know what door to go through. You'll know what decision to make because you're saying, I have the mind of Christ. I know what I'm meant to do. Even when you don't know, say that and you'll find that it brings to pass a knowledge in your thinking that wasn't there before. And Christ's mind begins to think through yours. All right. What do we have? We have power from the Holy Spirit. Number five. We have power of the Holy Spirit. When you're in Christ, you have access to the mighty Holy Spirit. Now, you know, uh, on this point, let me say this. Uh, many times uh, we have been, myself, uh, uh, have been associated with like the move of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and I'm, I'm committed to the activity of the Holy Spirit being in full force in the earth today. He is the New Testament. Uh, he is the New Testament come to earth. The law of the New Testament is written on our hearts by the Holy Spirit. He is the agent, the activity of God in our world today. He's a person. He's here instead of Jesus. And, and that's astonishing. I I, I, that's another study. But, but just, to, just to say this, that the work of the Spirit is not to draw attention to himself. If we put attention on him, he, he's almost grieved by that, offended. He is not here for that purpose. He is here to glorify Christ. He is here to point people to Jesus, not to himself. We are to commune with the Holy Spirit. That is be aware of him, walk according to the Spirit, have a mind on the Holy Spirit. But we're not here to worship him. We're here to worship Jesus Christ. We're here to pray to the Father. We pray to the Father 
through the power of Jesus, through the name of Jesus, in the purposes of Christ on the earth, we, we, we seek God. Jesus said, pray to the Father in heaven. So that's our, where, we, where we pray. Our worship is of God the Father and of Jesus Christ. Paul says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he praises Jesus as well. And so worship is directed towards God, our Father and God, Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. But the Holy Spirit is here to empower us to fulfill those prayers and that worship. And so when we are filled with the Spirit, because we're in Christ, we will actually bring to pass the will of God that He is wanting to happen in the earth. Let me say this, that it's, it's impossible to do the will of God without the power of the Holy Spirit. Can't be done. Be like trying to drive a car without petrol, trying to get a plane off the ground without fuel in the tank. The Holy Spirit is the fuel in the tank. No good just having fuel, though. You've got to have a plane to, 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 to fly in with, with its aerodynamics and whatever else. So it's when we're in Christ and we have the fuel, we have the combination that brings the power of God into planet Earth. And so Micah, the Old Testament prophet, he says, truly I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord. I'm full of power by the Spirit of the Lord. Luke 24 verse 49 says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but wait in the city of Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high. So when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, power comes on you. This is really important, especially for leaders. I mean, it's important for everybody, obviously. But I find leaders... Uh, often limited in what they can do and, and will do because of a lack of internal power and strength to actually carry out the decisions they're meant to do, to confront situations with people that they're meant to confront, to, to push a vision forward. Uh, and so leaders really must be filled with the Holy Spirit. Moses was filled with the Spirit. He put his hands on Joshua, who was filled with the Spirit. Elijah was filled with the Spirit, who confronted all of the prophets of Baal and the king of his current time. Then he put his anointing on Elisha, who followed him, took up the mantle, and he, he uh, brought great revival to the entire nation to have the power, supernatural power in our lives to accomplish what God has called us to do is absolutely imperative. And so that power is available to us to do way beyond what we ever thought we could do simply because the mighty power of the Holy Spirit is over our lives. What do we have? We have freedom from the devil. Number six, freedom from the devil. We are no longer under the devil. It says the whole world lies in the, hand, in, in the, in the harm or in the arms of the of the evil one. The whole world is under the sway of the wicked one, the prince and the power of the air in whom we all walked, it says, in disobedience and were led about and manipulated and maneuvered by these evil spirits. Once you meet Jesus Christ, you're free from that manipulation, from that, from that coercion of the, of the devil. 1 John 5.18 says, We know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who is born of God keeps himself and the wicked one does not touch him. Speaking about the devil. John 8, 31, Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed and you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. The truth will be a liberating force within you. I find that this message, this teaching, about living in Christ is one of the most sensational, liberating secrets I've ever come across. To understand who we are and what we have in Christ, which the devil has tried to make us ignorant of so that we remain in some kind of shabby, torn down Christian life, but instead we're to be the bright-eyed, visionary believers who are to affect the entire earth with the with, the, with Christ and the gospel. Jesus didn't die just for a few people here and there. He died for the entire world, that this world would be reconciled to God. And it is up to us 
to bring that message of Christ and the hope of the gospel into every person's life who's depressed with hopelessness and despairing of any meaningfulness in life. God has given to us great hope and we should bring this to the entire world. And the hope is Christ in you. He is the hope of glory. It is amazing how many scriptures locate the impact of what they're meant to do in Jesus Christ. Understand this. He is the New Testament. All right. So one of the things that we need to understand is that the word religion means to bind. And one of the most binding forces, one of the most chaining up forces in the world is legalism, especially religious legalism. And and when people get bound with that, it affects them at such a deep level. But once you hear the truth, the truth makes you free and you start to believe that it will set you free. We cannot afford to hold on to things that bind us. Jesus says in Mark 7 verse 13, that your traditions making the word of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down. The Bible is meant to have an effect on our lives, but traditions, religious traditions, render it powerless because we think the tradition is more powerful than the scripture. What we have believed, what our culture has delivered down through our our descendants and our religious heritage, we think that is how it's meant to be, even though it's powerless. We need to dispense with that as Jesus did when he walked through the temple and criticized them and said, you cannot be doing this, you shouldn't be doing that. And he said, the law of Moses is over. We have a new way of living coming in. I'm going to fulfill all that. It was so hard for people to understand, to even grasp, especially when the law of Moses had come down a mountain written with the finger of God by the mighty Moses delivered to the people of Israel. And and they're saying, how could God do away with that? God moves on. What he did yesterday, it can become old. And he leaves it. He says, I'm going to move on from that Old Testament. I'm going to have a New Testament. I'm going to have a new covenant. And in this new covenant, we're going to make it so that people are complete in Christ, that by the grace of God, all their sins are extinguished and they are completely put in right standing with me by divine fiat, by the divine command, not of their making, but of my making. I will qualify them and make them right with me. That is God's intention. That was his will. When he saw that the law wasn't working, his love demanded a new a new purpose, a new process by which men and women could find access into the the holiest place and stand with God. So to keep this freedom, this freedom in our lives, we need to understand that we've got to walk in the ways of God, not in the ways of tradition. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way that seems right to man, but the end thereof is death. Isaiah, he says in Isaiah 55 verse 9, about God. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts as far as the heavens are above the earth. And all of us know that's a long, long way. His thoughts are high. His thoughts are wonderful, magnificent. We need to ascend our thoughts into that zone so we can actually get a hold of all that God is thinking about. Let me just uh, spend a little time on this religious tradition thought, how it keeps on binding people and how God's thoughts are higher than all of that so that we don't find ourselves entangled with yokes of bondage, which Paul calls religious traditions. In 1 Timothy 4 verse 1, it says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and the doctrines of demons. How amazing is that? That within the church... It says some will depart from the faith. They will no longer believe in this faith thing, like I'm being positive and confident. No, 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 no. We're going to go for this, doctrines of demons. And you know what those doctrines were? To abstain from this and that and to forbid to marry, abstain from meat and not do these things. And so we find that that religious piety of abstinence and and withdrawing and restricting and binding people is thought of as being attractive to a religious, sincere mind. Paul says this is dragging people away from the faith and living in Christ to living in tradition, rendering 
the belief in God of no effect. They, their, their traditions make the Word of God of no effect. And so the need for us is to actually meditate on the Scripture and let that break the bondages of traditions off our minds and not let these traditions, these doctrines of demons, even when it's forbidding things and, and restraining and thinking this is so holy. I mean, it's, it's, you can feel quite guilty with a person who's saying, I live this very ascetic life. I don't do this and I don't do that. And, I don't, and you go, oh, golly, you know, that's amazing. But, but actually it's limiting them and restricting them from the freedom that Jesus has promised to bring. So in Christ, we have freedom. I'm looking forward to talking to you in the next session. Hey, thanks for watching this episode of the C3 Masterclass with Pastor Phil Pringle. If you happen to be living in Hong Kong, we'd love for you to join us at one of our Sunday services. For more information, check out our website, c3church.hk. We provide Cantonese and Mandarin simultaneous translation, plus we have full children's facilities for families. We look forward to meeting you. God bless.